Well, this is one of the unique conferences that we have uh, every couple of years, and it brings together, uh, in my mind, the best and most uh, influential people dealing with uh, metabolic uh, uh, ketogenic diet approaches to a variety of different neurological and neurodegenerative diseases. So you get a chance to interact in a very friendly way uh, because this is an emerging field. So the experts are becoming expert more and more with each one of these meetings. And what's remarkable to me is how the meetings have grown uh, in size with the, with the interest that seems to be spreading throughout the world uh, on using uh, non-toxic approaches to very uh, complicated and difficult diseases like, like epilepsy, uh, cancers, um, uh, various neurodegenerative diseases, uh, Alzheimer's disease. I mean, this seems to be um, bringing all these people together to share the common knowledge of how to, how to improve uh, this approach to disease management. So in that rate, I, I don't think there could be a better meeting anywhere uh, than this meeting. You're beginning to see uh, more and more therapeutic efficacy and refinement of the procedures. The groups of people that are getting together as teams are now uh, implementing these therapies in a far more uniform and effective way that, that uh, could only come from, from these kinds of, uh, of, of interactions. So people will go back to their individual universities or health clinics and they'll begin to apply these, these new technologies and learn from what we have here to make the overall approach for disease management much more effective. There's interest in it because, you know, it's a non-toxic approach for cancer management. And, you know, we focused on brain cancer, but, but, but um, it, it, it's effective as, for many different kinds of cancers. Um, but but um, I, think, I think people need to know more about why it's effective. And, and I think that's a very important reason because people say, oh, this is wonderful. How does it work? We, don't, we, don't, we know how it works. As a matter of fact, we know how it works better for cancer then we know how this metabolic approach works for any of the other diseases. It's very clear, okay? Tumor cells need to ferment. And this was shown by Otto Warburg many years ago. That is the defining characteristic of all cancer cells, or nearly all cancer cells. They will ferment, all right? They, use, they ferment two molecules, glucose and glutamine, all right? So if you target those molecules, and the ketogenic diet is effective in doing this, you can stop this disease. But you have to realize that this is a, a metabolic disease. It's not a genetic disease. And unfortunately, the tragedy is that for decades, we have viewed cancer as a genetic disease, spending hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars, trying to define therapies based on the idea that this is a genetic disease. When in fact, it is not. It's a mitochondrial metabolic disease, which makes, which makes it clear why we've had no major advances in cancer, nor will we ever have major advances in cancer until it becomes recognized as a metabolic disease. Once you make that recognition, then pr approaches like ketogenic diets make perfect sense. And, they, and you can see how the patients respond. And you can clearly see that this is an effective tool to manage the disease. Is it the only tool? No. But it's certainly a very powerful one. And it moves the whole view of what the disease is in a different direction. But as long as the field thinks that this is a gene-based disease, then you have this confusion and lack of progress. So this is one of the things that needs to be understood. Then it becomes clear why the ketogenic diet and these approaches that people are talking about at this meeting make so much sense and have so much potential for therapeutic efficacy. There are several reasons. There's never one reason. I always say there's never one reason for a tragedy. Usually there's multiple con congruent things that all happen together. All right. One is the lack of information. The physicians, many, are simply not trained. It's not part of their medical education to know how metabolic therapies could manage disease. They're just not trained in that. So you have this lack of knowledge. All right. So that's a fundamental problem. Um, there's a a, a, a reliance on, on procedures that have been used for decades uh, only because everybody always uses them. And there's been no challenge to that, despite uh, uh, all the evidence that it doesn't work. 
Um, and I hate to say it, but it's true. There's an economic issue, all right? These approaches that, that are used here, metabolic approaches, are simply not capable of generating the, the revenues to run medical schools and hospital clinics and this kind of thing. The, the revenue generate, this is not yet, the, the, the entrepreneur has not yet found a way to make this approach profitable. You know, there's bills to pay. How are you gonna run a hospital if you're using therapies that generate little revenue, all right? This is not compatible with the business model, all right? Despite the scientific evidence indicating that this will be a powerful new approach to managing the disease, no one has yet figured out how this can be profitable for the institutions and the individuals that are applying the therapy. Now this sounds terrible, but unfortunately, we're dealing not with a scientific issue, we're dealing with a policy issue. This has to be addressed at the highest levels of government and, and, the, and medical industry. If profitability is the only way we're going to succeed in treating patients for whatever disease, then this therapy can never be considered because it's just simply not going to fit the, the business plan. So this is a bigger issue, far bigger than any of the scientific evidence. Now people can say, well, the science isn't there yet. We haven't had clinical trials yet. Believe me, there's massive evidence to suggest the success of this approach. So the scientific issue is not, not, no longer a viable issue. It must be something other than that. And that's what I wrote in my book. These are other issues that go on uh, to this. The scientific issue is just a few bumps in the road. They throw that out there to make it look like, oh, this can't be done because we don't have all the science. Believe me, we have the science. It's just that people don't want to look at that science because it gets them too disturbed to know we have something, but we can't use it for other reasons which go beyond science. And, and this is the way I view the situation. Unfortunately, many people uh, die uh, from the therapy uh, rather than the disease. In fact, I dedicated my book to those individuals, the ones that, 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 uh, that die from the therapies. Um, that's, uh, that's an unacceptable tragedy. This is just, out, uh, you know, if you're going to die, you want to die from the disease, not the treatment. Um, the problem is, of course, is that uh, the treatments that are used are extremely toxic. Uh, we, we don't know of any any medical treatment um, that we give to people other than cancer where, where, where the treatment involves poisoning and irradiating people to make them healthy. I mean, this stands to as, as, as nobody, nobody does this except for the cancer patients for the most part, right? I mean, you don't see, they're given very toxic drugs and there by the grace of God, they survive the toxicity. Not on all patients, patients respond well to this. But, but the issue is, is why are we doing that? Why are we using toxicity to treat a disease and, and toxicity on top of toxicity? Because it's the standard of care. Um, is there another way that we could achieve the same endpoint without poisoning and irradiating the people? All right, and the answer is yes. But again, it comes back to the policy issues. Do you really want to improve the health of the patient or do you have other issues that you need to deal with? All right? can guess the other issues. But these are the things. So, it, and the standards of care are almost written in stone, in granite, that cannot be erased from every major medical school in the civilized world, all right? You can go to India, you can go to Japan, Germany, the United States, Great Britain, they all do the same thing. And no one changes that procedure. Yeah, you go and tell me what's going on with that. Why is that the case? You know, look, look behind the, the, the smoke in the mirrors and you might find the answer. It has to go back to what the origin of the disease is. And um, as Otto Warburg had clearly indicated and as our research has shown and as emerging evidence is showing, all of the tumor cells seem to share the same problem. They ferment. So we would have to find a cancer that no longer ferments. And if you find a cancer that doesn't ferment, it wouldn't be a cancer. So the answer is there's probably no cancer that we know of that would be resistant to this metabolic therapy. So this is, uh, and every cancer that we've treated, whether it's lung, colon, breast, uh, ovarian, uh, uterine cancer, brain cancer, they all seem to have some level of therapeutic benefit. 
You know, they could be improved better for some than others, but they all seem to respond in one way or another. Clinical trials for the metabolic therapy like ketogenic diets and things like this um, are hard to do. Um, they don't follow the, 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 uh, the structure uh, that has been recommended by Food and Drug Administration and, and, and uh, various medical organizations to, to provide uh, definitive evidence uh, that this would be a, 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 a viable therapeutic approach. Um, and you know we did we did those trials for epilepsy. We followed, and it was a, it was a tremendously innovative approach to 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 prove to people that the the ketogenic diet does have therapeutic benefit when done in a standard type of clinical trial. And even after that, people still don't. So it's it's like oh I've done everything you've asked to do, and yet um, it's still not well recognized or or or, or spoken about. So. Are we to go through the same thing with cancer? Because this is, again, this cuts much deeper than whether it's going to work in a clinical trial. Ask the people who are living, who took the therapy. It, ask them over and over again. Round them up uh, and ask, do you think, uh, ask those survivors, do they think a clinical trial would be helpful to, to manage this disease while they're standing there? They can, the, the, the survivors who are healthy can probably address that more. Do they, do they think they would have benefited from a clinical trial? I don't think so. So uh, th this is a situation where even if we were to run the clinical trial and prove that this would be working, and it probably would if we designed it in certain ways, would it make it any more used considering the other issues that are behind the scenes? I don't think so. So m my view is treat as many people with this as possible have the survivors tell others that this is the way to go and let it roll from there. The people make the decision. Why should the medical profession with a less than stellar track record in this field be making decisions on the very souls of others? I mean, it'd be one thing if their track record was, was pristine and these recommendations would, would be beneficial to many pe most people. They're not. So when you have the establishment dictating wh the way you should do something, when they themselves don't have a good track. It's like everything is upside down. So I think it needs to be reevaluated. Do we need to do clinical trials? We need to treat some patients. Do they survive longer than, than normal? Are they healthy? Oh, if, they're in, if they're, you know, you're supposed to live three or four months or two years, and you're out there five years? I mean, what do you say about this? So it's a fluke? Well, how many flukes do we have to see before we become convinced that there might be something important about this? And if they say, oh, you need a clinical trial, that's there as a block. It's because these kinds of approaches are much more complicated than whether a person has the drug or the placebo. Okay, the, 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 what, the, the, the understanding is much more complicated than that. So we just have to push forward. And the people themselves will come to say, we want ketogen, we want metabolic therapy for cancer, or we've seen we don't want it. And if you, if you don't do these things right, it's like anything, it, they may not be as effective as if, if they're done right. So you take small groups of people, you work with the small groups of people because they're very labor intensive. That's another thing. This is not very simple. This is labor intensive. Every person is a different uh, entity. It must be treated slightly different. So therefore, that confuses clinical trial. Whoa, you did something different from here, from that person. But they all end up achieving benefit. So clinical trial setup, it has to be designed in a very different way than the standard ways of doing this. So they throw out, let's do a clinical trial. We can't believe it until you've done a clinical trial. Well, those clinical trials will never happen the way they think they should happen. So again, people have to make a decision. Do we want to modify the system in certain ways to allow us to see whether or not this is going to be effective? Once they make those kinds of decisions, I think we're going to see a lot, a lot of uh, improvement in understanding uh, this. And people know now the internet, they can read. They can see for themselves. If they don't, they can go and talk. They can call somebody up. How did you make out using this? Yeah, I feel great. I did okay. You know, oh, well, what were the complications? They'll, they'll all talk. There'll be groups of people. They'll be talking. They will not get all their information from the medical profession because the medical profession is untrained in this. Most of them, not all of them, some of them. So how are you going to go to a person who has no knowledge about the system and ask them about certain nuances when the person who's already completed the, 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 the therapy knows more than the person that's delivering the other therapy? It doesn't make any sense, does it? <laughs>
the new community by our research analyst, Johnny Rockermeyer. Within this new community platform, you can connect with other patients and learn from their experiences. You can also just search through the posts other members have already made. You will have access to our classroom section as well, which provides practical advice and tools for the best results. These sections cover all parts of the Press Pulse protocol that you should implement. Starting with the general scientific concepts by Dr. Thomas Seifred, we will show you how to start the ketogenic diet, including which foods to choose and which to avoid. Additionally, we prepared a list of doctors specialized in metabolic therapy, as well as details about glutamine inhibition and hyperbaric oxygen protocols. So, take a look around at school.com slash keto for cancer.